but we'll walk through the concepts because there's a couple of problems on the tests that are like this. So the first two questions have to do with like incremental differences, you know, if I do this or if I do that. And the important thing to understand is that you don't have to look at everything. You only have to look at what's different. Like if I make the units versus if I buy the units, what is the difference? You don't need the big picture. So Haber Company currently produces RX-5 for its sole product. I had a question about the tables we're supposed to use in Appendix B. Uh, we'll look at that. The current cost per unit to manufacture the required 56,000 units of RX-5 follows. So we have direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. So we know that that's our, that's our cost to manufacture it. So to make it, we have our direct materials of $5 per unit. I seem to be numerically challenged today. Wait, come on. Okay, that's weird. All right, $5 per unit, direct labor. Of $9 per unit. And overhead. of $10 per unit. All right, so that's how much it costs us to make the product. Direct materials and labor are 100% variable, which means that for every product we produce, we're gonna incur the cost for direct materials and direct labor. If we produce no product, we would not have direct materials or direct labor. Overhead is 80% fixed. An outside supplier has offered to supply the 56,000 units for $20 per unit. Okay, so we're gonna have to pay $20 per unit. $20, was that? Yeah, $20 per unit if we're gonna buy them. Plus, do we have any overhead costs that we have to, that we're still gonna have? If overhead is 80% fixed, 10%. how much? Would it be at the, 20, the, the other 20%? Well, think about it. The overhead is 80% fixed. That means that 80% of it isn't going to change no matter how much we um, produce or don't produce. So do we still have the 80% or do we still have the 20%? So if you think about it, okay, if it's fixed, it doesn't matter how much we produce. So we're going to have $8 of overhead no matter if we produce one unit or 5,000 units. If we produce no units, 20% of that overhead is not fixed. It's variable. So if we produce no units, do we have to pay the 80% of overhead or the 20%? 80%. The 80%. It will be the 80%, right? It'll be the 80%, right. Oh, the reason it's, hold on a minute, honey, I'm teaching. I love you, it'll be fine. Okay. Honey, she, go away. Okay, so the 20% is variable and the 80% is fixed. That means that 80% of it has nothing to do with production. So that's why 80% of it we're gonna keep regardless of if we stop producing the product or not. Does that make sense? Amber, is that good? Hi, Liz. Okay. Hi. So it's gonna cost us $28 basically to buy it and $24 to make it. So obviously we're gonna say we should just make it. Okay, is that one good? There's one like that on the test. 
All right, now we're going to calculate incremental um, revenues and costs. So incremental means the change in. So an incremental revenue would be the difference in revenue between you know, doing A or doing B. So here we have three alternatives. So incremental revenue is the difference in revenue between the three of them and the difference in cost between the three of them. So you don't need like to do a whole full income statement to figure out the impact that a decision is going to have. You can look at just what changes and then add that onto the bottom line. So Herald Manufacturing produces denim clothing. This year it produced 5,280 denim jackets at a manufacturing cost of $42 each. Okay, so they're manufacturing it at $42 each. These jackets were damaged in the warehouse during storage. Management investigated the matter and identified three alternatives. One, the jackets can be sold to a secondhand shop for $8. So we'll get $8 if we sell them. Two, the jackets can be disassembled at a cost of $32,400 and sold to a recycler for $11,000. You know, I think, I don't know if we're supposed to do like the total <clears throat> or the other way, does it say? Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, a, so instead of eight, we'll say eight times there's um, 52,800 of them. So we could sell them right now for $422,400. I just took the $8 that we'd sell it for times the number of jackets. And there would be no costs associated with that. Because we're just selling them as is. If we were to take them apart and sell them, redo them, we can sell them for $11 each. So $11 times 5280 jackets. Oh, you know what? I think I used an extra zero over here. I'll fix that in a minute. Let's go back there. 5280 times eight dollars, 42,240. Yeah. There we go. If we did alternative two, it's going to cost us $32,400 in labor to have the jackets disassembled to sell to the recycler. So even though we're getting more money, we're actually making less profit. Alternative three, the jackets can be reworked and turned into good jackets. However, the damage management estimates it will, it will be able to assemble the good parts of the, ja of the 50 to 80 jackets into only 3,040 jackets. The remaining pieces of the fabric will be discarded. The cost of reworking the jackets will be $101,800. And if they can sell them for $41 each, they're only selling 3,040 jackets. So they're selling it for 124,640. So when we look at these three and we just take the difference in revenue and the difference in cost, what would our decision be? Alternative one. Yeah, that's the one we make the most on. Okay. Oh yeah, I went and gave you guys full credit for that one. Okay, the tables. I did it by accident, but I didn't, didn't change it. Um, most company has an opportunity to invest in one of two projects. Project Y requires a $315,000 investment for new machinery with a four year life and no salvage value. Project Z requires a $315,000 investment for new machinery with a three year life and no salvage value. The two projects yield the following predicted annual results. The company uses straight line depreciation and cash flows occur evenly throughout the year. We actually don't need the present value tables here because we're not looking at present value. All we're doing is looking at payback. Payback is like down and dirty. It's just a quick way of figuring out, you know, how long will it take me to make back the money I spent? 
does not take into account time value of money. It's a really good tool for like an initial analysis before you really start looking seriously at it. It's kind of like if you're looking at a project or a purchase and it passes this test, then you might start looking further and using time value of money to consider it. So all we're doing here is taking the cost of the project and dividing it by the um, number of um, the cash flows for the period. So we have sales, 315,000, and our revenue is 370, wait. So we're dividing it by the annual net cash inflows. Oh, I didn't scroll down. That explains it. <laughs> and the cost of the investment. So project Y costs us 315,000 and project Z costs us 315,000. We're not concerned with the depreciation here. We're bringing in 53,010 for project Y, and project Z is going to bring in 34,410. So one of them takes, so, the, so both investments has an outlay of $315,000, but project Y will recoup our investment much more quickly. So that's just down and dirty. What does it look like? So for accounting rate of return, I actually don't have you doing accounting rate of return. I should have done full credit on this one. And And you don't have to do this either. You don't have to, you need to focus on what's on the test. Let me go over here. You do time value of money in chapter five in intermediate accounting. Three, four, five, okay, how many of you guys have done the synchronous session problems? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. My week has been crazy. <laughs> My day has been crazy. At least my whole week hasn't been crazy. God, I wish people would go back to work so my internet will work. I feel like back when I had dial up, I had dial up halfway through my master's degree. My husband finally just had them come in and put in like cable for the, for the internet. Cause I'm like, I don't need anything else. It's fine. It works just fine. I would go upstairs to the office, turn my, my email, start downloading my email. I go downstairs, change clothes, get a snack, come back upstairs, sit down, look at my computer. And it was just finishing up downloading my email you know, PowerPoints and stuff like that for class. I remember oh, as soon as we used to make dough. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Over here on yeah. base, we have only one internet provider and because everybody is at home, you know, with this social distance, mm. everybody's using internet. So for me, it's almost difficult to watch videos. So sometimes- Oh yeah, I'm, the streaming, like, right. Yes, it's so bad, and you, I cannot go even 
like a Starbucks because it's closed, you know, because right, of the Right, right, I know. I was thinking like, about... You know, I'm going to go you know, get out of base. So I'm like... <laughs> you can't go any... Right, dude, you don't have any options. <laughs> Well, see, honestly, so I'm like trying, trying so hard. And sometimes a video, it takes like three hours to me. Our for whole, to, to, watch to, um, to school so you can watch it. Oh my God. What the heck? Adjust credit for all students. You don't have to do the last ones. I'll go figure out if I can adjust credit. It's too slow. Slow, slow, slow. Very slow. Um, synchronous sessions. Will make your life easy. So you can take the final. Okay, so this is just helping you identify the relevant costs. So Zia company currently buys a component part for $9 per unit. So if they buy it, they buy $9 per unit, right? Do you, can, honey? Can I bring my desktop? I'm teaching right now. Can I bring my desktop? Okay, so can I'm gonna go. I'm going to go over here. Okay, the make, making the part is going to require $6.30 of direct materials. $1.15 for direct labor. And overhead is 230% of direct labor. So overhead is going to be $1.15 times 230%. See my calculator? 1.15 times 230 percent $2.65. So that's overhead. So overhead is $2.65. And so it looks like it costs us $10.10 if I did the math correctly to make it. All right, does this one make sense? Yes. Yes. So I said, see if I did the math right. I didn't. <laughs> Predetermined overhead rate, what am I missing? Buys a component for $9. Please, and making the part would be $6.30 materials and $1.15 per unit of direct labor. They allocate overhead using a predetermined overhead rate, an incremental overhead rate of 55 cents per unit to make the part. That's irrelevant. So it must have been my math. So 230% times $1.15 is 265. 265 plus nine. Nope, not nine. You believe that it's 10.05. Oh, that is what I calculated. I did the. <laughs> See what happens when I erase my work, my work before I do anything. Wait. Well, it should be 10.045, but 10.05. Right. Wait, what the heck? I'm going to do it again just in case. What happened to number two? What happened to number? How 
have it turn into wait it should be eight dollars wait show my answers what the heck Oh, 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 I'm not thinking. I left my thinking cap at home. The so relevant cost. So what part of the overhead is relevant? Okay, so direct materials and direct labor are both relevant. Predetermined overhead rate of 230% of direct labor costs but we estimate an incremental overhead rate of 55 cents per unit. So it's only the incremental rate that we're gonna take into consideration. The rest is fixed. So $6.30 plus $1.15 plus 55 cents is the $8. And obviously they should make the part. All right, does that make sense? Because the rest of the overhead is, that's what I meant by incremental. Okay, Holmes Company produces, so we're going to do the incremental income if they sell it as is or if they process further. So Holmes Company produces a product that can be either sold as is or processed further. Holmes has already spent $94,000 to produce 1,600 units that can be sold now for 79,500. So if we sell them now, we'll get 79,500 with no additional processing costs. Alternatively, Holmes can process the units further at an incremental cost of $2.70 per unit. So if they process further, they're going to have an increment. They're going to, but they can sell them for four fifty each. So four hundred and fifty dollars times the number of units, sixteen hundred. So if they do this, seems like a huge difference. 450 times 1,600, 720,000. Additional processing costs, but the processing costs are gonna be 270 per unit. So $270 times 1,600 units is 432,000. So if we brought in 720,000, but it cost us four hundred and thirty-two thousand. We're making two hundred and eighty-eight thousand. So the incremental revenue. Wow, that's huge. That just seems like I did something wrong. The incremental revenue is seven hundred and twenty thousand minus seventy-nine thousand five hundred. So the difference in revenue is six hundred and forty thousand five hundred. The difference in cost is 432,000. So when you're only dealing with one product, it's easy to see the answer. So basically we're saying, if we processed it further, we would make $208,500 more. if I did it correctly, which I did. Okay, does that make sense? How do you get the 720,000 to process further? I got the 720 by taking, I got the process further I took for the sales. They can be sold for 450 each, so I just took $450 times the number of units I have 
gave me the 720,000. Okay, thank you. And then the 432 I got by taking how much it cost to produce the units. So I still had 1,600 units times 270. Yeah, 270 is what gave me the 432,000. Good? Yes, thank you. You are very welcome. Oh, I love the division, should they be eliminated? Okay, a guitar manufacturer is considering eliminating its electric guitar division because it's $84,760 of expenses are higher than its $78,980 in sales. So in other words, when you look at the different divisions for this music company, they're losing money on the electric guitars that they're selling. So we want to figure out, should we keep it or not? Um, so if we keep it, we have sales of, okay. we have sales of 78,980. So I'm going to put sales of 78,980. If we eliminate it, we have no sales. If we keep it, we have expenses of $84,760, hold on, do my, which is gonna be the total expenses. So my cost of goods sold, if I keep it is 59,500. My direct expenses, are 10,650. My indirect expenses and my service department costs, oops, this one has one too. We're gonna add these together because my direct expenses, if I keep it, I have to pay all of this, my avoidable and my unavoidable. So if I keep it, I'm gonna pay 10,000 650 plus 2450. So this one is 13,100. In my indirect expenses, they're going to be 980 plus 1650, 2630. And for my service department costs, they're going to be 7600 plus 1930. So this will be 9,530. So my direct expenses will actually be 13,100. My indirect expenses will be 2630. And my service department costs will be 9530. If I, if I eliminate it, if I say, you know what, we, we're losing money on our guitars, so we're going to stop selling those. We'll keep selling everything else, but we're losing money here, so we'll stop selling it. Obviously, my sales will be zero. All of my cost of goods sold is gone. I won't have any cost of goods sold because I'm not manufacturing and selling the guitars. My direct expenses, I can avoid 10650 but I'm still going to have, whether I manufacture or sell guitars or not, I'm still gonna have 2450 in direct expenses. And I'm still gonna have 1650 in indirect expenses and 1930 in service costs that I can't get rid of. So if I keep the division, I'm going to have a loss. I'm gonna pay. Oops, I just closed my calculator. I'm going to have a loss because I have revenue of 78980 minus my expenses of 84760 
So I'm going to have a loss of 57.80. If I eliminate the division, I'm not going to have any revenue, but I'm going to have total cost of the 2450 plus the 1650 plus the 1930 plus, oh, that's it. I already totaled them. 6031 well, is stupid. So I'm going to have a loss of 6030. So what this means, first of all, when you're looking at this, is that if I eliminate the division, because of the cost that I can't get rid of, it's still going to cost me more than my loss does. Does that piece make sense? Yes. So I probably don't want to eliminate the division, right? And part of that's because of cost sharing with other divisions. You know, like when we take the overhead and we divide it up among um, different divisions, if one of those divisions goes away, our overhead isn't changing. We're just going to divide it up amongst less divisions. Okay, so revenue from the electric Car division is 7.80, or maybe it means sales. I bet it means sales. Seven eight. Let me see. Let me see what we're doing. Avoidable expenses. So 59,500 that I can get rid of. Oops. Plus. 10,650 plus 980 plus 7,600. So I have 78,730 in avoidable expenses. So the revenue is greater than the avoidable expenses. So 78980 minus 78730 by $250. So should the electric guitar, which is the difference between this 5780 and the 6030. So I have a loss of 6030. if I eliminate the division, minus I have a loss of 5780 if I keep the division. So the difference is $250. I end up losing $250 less money by keeping the division than I would if I eliminated it. Does that make sense? Do you see where the 250 comes from? It's these two. So I'm losing $250 more by getting rid of it. Are we good? Okay. So we'll keep it. A lot, any losses or outflows should be entered with the minus sign. Incremental income from replacing a machine. Okay, Roy Company, Rory Company has a machine with a book value of 89000 dollars Five-year life. A new machine is available at a cost of 113,500. Rory can also receive $76,000 for trading in his new machine. Now, 
the new machine will reduce variable manufacturing costs by $23,000 per year. So if we want to figure out what's the difference in income, or in this case, cost, um, between keeping the old machine or replacing it, so we're going to have the cost of the new machine, any losses or outflows. So it's going to cost us $113,500, but we can trade in our old machine for $7,600, $76,000. The book value doesn't matter in incremental income from replacing the machine. And we have a reduction in manufacturing costs of $23,000 per year over its five-year life. So since we're looking at the total, we're going to have to take the $23,000 per year times five years. So we actually have 23,000 times five is 115,000. So our reduction in cost, it's saving us 115,000. So now we have incremental income of 77,500. So now we need to know what do they want us to do with that? Oh, I do need the book value of the old machine. I'm lazy. Cost of the machine. We're going to trade it in for $76,000. That's what I did. They're going to save us $115,000 in manufacturing costs. So we have incremental income of $77,500. That's what I did. Why did it say that was wrong? Oh, I must have selected book value of old machine by accident. The book value doesn't matter because it has nothing to do with, with with trading in the machine at all. It's like if your car has a, well, okay, so it's not the same. Because when you think of a car, you think of your blue book value, which tells you how much it's worth. But um, when you depreciate something, remember that the book value is not related to what that item is worth. It's not related to fair market value. So the book value, although we're going to have to do a journal entry when we trade it in, is not relevant in figuring out how much that machine is going to cost us. All right, are we good here? Oh, selling price with a markup. This is kind of what I was showing you guys um, Tuesday and last week. So we sell snowboards. Each snowboard requires direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead. And we have our fixed overhead and our selling and admin and how many we expect to produce. What will the selling price be if Garcia uses a markup of 15% of total cost? So we want to first figure out what is the total cost. So we have direct materials of $101. And we want to do this per unit because this is per unit. So direct materials of $101, direct labor of $31, variable overhead of $46. We still have fixed overhead. 
but we're gonna have to figure out how much that is. So we have $637,000 of fixed overhead and we're making 10,100 units is what we're selling. So we have to figure out how much is that fixed overhead per unit. So if we have 637,000 divided by 10,100, that is $63.07 per unit. So fixed overhead is $63.07. Fixed selling and admin. I don't know if they want us to include that. Let's try it without first. So $101 plus $31 plus $46 plus $63.07. So I have $241.07. Now that's the cost. So this is our cost if we don't include admin, we'll see. So that's our cost per unit. But if we want to sell it with a 15% markup, we're going to say $241.07 times 1.15. And what that means is 100% of this plus 15%. So 241.07 times 1.15. One five, we would sell it for two hundred and seventy-seven dollars and twenty-three cents. If we don't include the selling and admin, so let's see if they want us to include that or not. Two seventy-seven twenty-three. because I bet we're supposed to include the admin. Like, how would we know that without being told that? Yep, that's it, we include the admin. Oops. So that's the only difference. So if you took the, if you did this the slow way, like if you took to figure out a 15% markup, You could do it the long way by saying, okay, $258 times 15% is 258 times 15% is $38 and 70 cents. So we're gonna take $258, oh, that's how they did it, plus 38.70. And that gives you 296.70. Or you can just say $258 times 1.15%. Well, actually, that is percent. So 258 point times 1.15 is 296.70. Because what this 1.15 means is all of it, one whole, plus another 15%. So it's just faster that way. Also leaves less room for error. On a multiple choice test, at least the answer is right in front of you, but when it isn't, this leaves less room for error doing it this way. Oh, that was all of them. Let's go back to the next one. <clears throat> Mm. 
It's been a rough week for everyone, huh? A lot of people. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think my work news is the last week of this class. <laughs> so then I decided to explode. <laughs> you're like, seriously? <laughs> There's four weeks and this is the week you're gonna do this? Yeah. Yeah, and today or this week was only a four day work week. Right, I know, right? That's and I have duty the whole week. <laughs> oh God. My husband was like, Yeah, it's only a four day work week. That'll be great. And I'm like, yeah, that just means you cram six days into four. All right, so this was the payback period. So remember, all we're doing is down and dirty. We're spending $27,000. Oops, cost of the investment. Divided by the annual cash inflows. So we're spending $27,000 and it's gonna give us $9,000 a year for four years. So it takes three years to pay it back, which is good because if it took four, that'd be a problem because it's life is four years. So basically what this means is the first, nine, the first three years of $9,000, we're not really making anything, but the last year we are. So we're making just down and dirty $9,000 on this investment. So Park Company is considering an investment that requires immediate payment of $27,000 and provides expected cash inflows of $9,000 annually. They require a 10% return on its investment. So what we have is, we have a select chart. So what we have is, you know, you know the, the saying that um, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, right? So when you're looking at an investment and you want to become a little more concrete about its value, you're going to have to take into consideration time value of money. Because like in that last example that we looked at, that $9,000, $9,000 three years from now isn't worth $9,000 today. So what we're doing when we take into account this, like this type of problem is we are discounting everything back to today's value. So what we're doing is we're gonna take the annual cash flow of $9,000 annually for four years. And we're going to find out what is the present value of $9,000 a year for four years. If we invested it, at 10%. So we're looking for the present value. And this is an annuity. It's an annuity because what an annuity is, is a stream of continual payments of the same amount. So like if you're collecting a pension, that's an annuity. Or if you're investing and you invest the same amount, that's an annuity. If you win the lottery and you claim and you decide not to take all the money all at once, you'll have an annuity. So we're gonna look at the present value of an annuity and it's for $9,000 a year. And what we're gonna do is the time is four years. The interest is 10%. So I'm gonna go to this PVA, present value of an annuity. And when I pull up this chart, here's how this works. The way this works is on the top is the interest. So there's our 10% interest. On this side, we're looking at the time. So we have four years. So we're gonna go over to where the two meet and that's what we multiply it by. So we're gonna multiply the $9,000 times 3.1699. And what this is going to tell us is how much $9,000 over four years like this would be worth today. So 9,000 times 3.1699. So this is gonna be worth 
$5,529.10. What this means is also, if I took $28,529.10 and I put it in the bank at 10% interest, which of course is unheard of right now, I put it in the bank at 10% interest, four years from now, I would have um, $36,000. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, we have 3.1699 and 28.3.1699. So when I go back here, 3.1699. So the present value of that is $28,529 today. We have our outflow, we're gonna purchase it for $27,000. Wonder if I have to put a negative there. So 28,529 is how much we'll get back minus 27,000 is the investment. So 1529. Okay, now here's the other funny thing. So we look at this and you think, oh, that present value is 1,529. The funny thing about this is that anything over zero, even if it was one, anything over zero means that we should do the investment, that it's okay. And the reason that is, is because we want a 10% return on the investment. We already took that $9,000 and figured in a 10% return. So we've already taken into consideration the 10%. So what we're saying is, we're actually going to make more than 10% on this investment. We're gonna make $1,529 more than 10%. And you're not gonna get this all at one time. It takes some time to, the present future value is really weird because when it clicks, it's like, oh, well that was easy, but um, until it clicks, it's not. You don't have to do internal rate of return. I'll give you credit for this. Oh, can you skip it or not? You can't, can you? Can you skip it? Well, yes, but it's gonna read. No, you can actually, I think so. I'm gonna give you zero points. Yeah but it's gonna give you the answer. So you should have 3,000 and between 12 and 15%. So what internal rate of return does, and the reason I'm not having you do it here, is you really need to use a computer for it. Because what this does is it takes a number, I mean, if they make it easy numbers, then it works, but most of the time it doesn't. What you're doing when you're doing um, this type of accounting internal rate of return is that you're, you're finding a dollar amount and then you're going to the table and you're looking for that percentage that you came close to on here. So it's like you're working backwards, but you're usually estimating because it's hardly ever exactly that number so like here, we see internal rate of return is between 12 and 15%. That's why I don't, you don't have to do them. And what is this? Well, this is kind of interesting. So Heels, a shoe manufacturer is evaluating the cost and benefit of new equipment that would custom fit each pair of athletic shoes. The customer would have his or her foot scanned by digital computer equipment. This information would be used to cut the raw materials to provide the customer a perfect fit. 
the new equipment cost $90,000. So here's our outflow for the new equipment right here, outflow of $90,000. So we start with a negative. Then everything is, else is going to be um, what comes in after that. So the new equipment costs $90,000 and is expected to generate $35,000 in cash flows for five years. So what that means is we're getting $35,000 a year for five years. That $35,000 a year for five years, we have to figure out what is it worth today? $35,000 a year, every year for five years is an annuity. And we wanna know what is its value today? So we're gonna look at this for five years, 10% interest. So we're gonna go to the present value of an annuity and we're gonna go to five years at 10% interest. So we're going to multiply by 3.7908. So when we do that, three point seven nine zero eight. So what that is saying is that $35,000 a year for five years times 3.7908 is worth $132,678 today. Cumulative present value of inflow outflow. Okay, what else happens? A bank will make a $90,000 loan to the company at a 10% interest rate for this equipment's purchase. Use the following table to determine the break-even time for this equipment. All cash, oh shoot, $5,000 in cash for five years. No, that's right. Oh, all cash flows occur at the end of the year. If it was the beginning of the year, it's a different type of annuity. Okay, so we have, so we did the outflow, but we have the interest on the loan, which is interest on the loan. Bank will make a $90,000 loan to the company at a 10% interest rate. Doesn't say when we're paying it though. So 90,000 times 10%. So the interest on the loan is $9,000. I'm gonna take a stab and assume we're paying it all back at the end because they don't say anything different. So that means that we're paying $9,000. Actually, this is a negative because it's an outflow. So what we're saying here is, okay, so there's $9,000 that we're gonna spend in interest, but we're gonna spend it five years from now. So present value of one, something's wrong here. So present value of one for five periods, 10% interest, 0 0.6209, 0 0.6209. Point six two zero nine. So nine thousand dollars five years from now. 
there's something wrong here with my, with, there's something wrong with what I'm doing with interest. $90,000, oh, they didn't use an annuity. I wondered what all those blanks were or and why we were dealing with interest. Okay, you know what's wrong with this problem? What's wrong with this problem is that, okay, so what they did was this $35,000 is an annuity. So really you should do it with one line. What they've done here is they said, okay, let's take the $35,000 a year because I've never seen it. Okay, so what they're doing is they're saying, let's calculate break even. So we're starting off with our $9,000 outflow, right? We're gonna take this $35,000 and we're gonna calculate break even, including the time value of money. So this first $35,000, we're gonna say, this $35,000 we're paying at the end of year one. We want to know how much is it worth today because we're paying it at the end of year one. So we're going to go to the present value of one and this one is one period at 10%. Uh, 10 yeah, 0 0.9091. And then the next one the next 35 one year at 10 percent yeah it's going to be two and then the next one and you'll keep going like that um normally you just do the whole thing the reason we're not doing the whole thing right here is because we're trying to calculate break even when do we break even given the present value of the money um the problem with doing break even using the present value of the money is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it this way. It makes a lot of sense to compare um, present value and see how much you're getting back in today's dollars versus today's dollars that you're making for the investment. But it doesn't make sense to calculate the um, break even time in present value dollars because when you get those dollars, you don't get it for another year or two years. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it this way. But for our present value of $35,000, one year out is $31,819. So look at year five. At year five, this $35,000 is only worth $21,732. And the reason it's worth, you can see as we go farther out, it's worth less and less money. I'm boring you. It's worth less and less money. Um, this comes into play like if you have an investment where um, the money is going to come in sooner in this one and, and later in the other one, you're going to find that the one where the money comes in sooner is going to um, pay off better than the one where it comes in later. Let's see what else is here. You don't have to do profitability index either. Um, score answer, score now, show correct answers. And that's it. Okay, because it's not on the test. You don't have to be able to do it. Okay, so how do you feel about the test? Doing number five or not? No, you don't do number five, but there's the answers. I'll give you credit for the synchronous sessions anyway. Um, what I want you to do is really, really, really prepare for the final. Okay, I know you need to study, but other than needing to study, how do you feel about it? Okay. I'm nervous. <laughs> okay, that's reasonable though. It's a final exam. Would a good way to study be to uh, go back and do the recharge sessions in LearnSmart? Yeah, you could. Um, the first thing that I would do to study is I would go and I'd look at the PowerPoints for the questions. And then if you look at it and you can work it, I wouldn't, I would take the blank one 
and try doing it on your own because a lot of the time when you're looking at the answer, you think you know it, but you don't. So I would take that and try to work it. And then if you know it, great. If you don't, go review that piece. Go look at what chapter that concept was in so that you're not reviewing everything. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and you're right, the PowerPoints are a good one. Um, so are the short questions, but I would just, I would use the review to see, you know, where where are you deficient? Where are you having, you know, difficulty still? And then go back and, and look at that week's material, that piece, and go review any videos you see on it, especially ones I did. Okay, the, the only thing that's gonna be kind of weird this weekend is I'm leaving Saturday to go visit my uncle. So we're driving all day to um, North Carolina on Saturday. But I mean, I'll have my phone and it looks like a straight freeway shot all the way down. So I don't even think there's gonna be any internet issues or phone issues the whole way. And then I'll check stuff when I get there. So you can reach me by text all weekend. You all look tired or nervous. <laughs> Oh, okay. Have a good weekend, except for the final. You can take it through through Sunday. I'm going to say this again. I know I say it every time. If there's something that interferes with your ability to be successful, please call me. Let me know. Reach out so that um, you know, so that I can. Because if you have to take it on Monday, you have to take it on Monday. I want to know what you know. And I can't know what you know if you're in a spot where you can't really take it or focus. Okay, Liz, are your, are your coworkers tired of hearing accounting? <laughs> I had a girl that did it one time, a woman in class that, that had it on at, um, in a hospital and didn't have, didn't have headphones or anything with her. Her daughter, she'd taken her to the emergency room. So yeah, she's, that's okay. I've lectured at hotels right outside of the bar, and I'm thinking those poor people—they're in there trying to relax, and here I am talking on and on about accounting. I did. I did that in my in my watch the other day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Japanese were looking at me I'm like, oh, "What is she doing?" What is that? <laughs> like it's accounting. I'm learning accounting. <laughs> okay, I will talk to you if you have problems. Other than that, I really appreciate you guys faithfully coming every week and, um, and working so hard because you really have. And you're going to reach out if there's anything that you need. And I'll have grades done next week. Okay? Hey, Doc. Thank you for everything. Yep. Really, really appreciate it. So we, we just need to do the homework and the course project and the final exam for this week? Yep. And... Not as a discussion. Oh, and the discussion. So no synchronous sessions? Well, I kind of gave you the answers. Just, just make sure you do well on the test. Because remember, the <laughs> final exam will take the place of... Um, First one. Uh, of any test that's lower than the final. One test that's lower than the final. Liz is like, I've already pegged it. It's the first one. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, your bonus for being here is you don't have to do the synchronous session if you don't want to. I'll give you credit anyway. Um, please, please study and be prepared though because that will, um, that's okay, Carl. Carl, you know the material, it's good. Carl, right. you should wait, that's your fault. <laughs> yeah, great. I'm teaching you wait till the last minute. <laughs> Go to the next class. That's been taught me to wait till the last minute. <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> please, please, please don't do that. Okay. Call me if you have questions. Call me if you need anything. Text me, reach out, and I will talk to you later. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Try safe. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.